themselves subject to widespread hate crime, may have made the Home Office reluctant to acknowledge the later two types of hate crimes. Next, pastor prosecuted for sermon preached in his own church. The freedom to preach and evangelise and seek to convince others of the truth of one's beliefs achieved in 1812 is both absolutely central to freedom of religion and an essential part of freedom of speech. A Christian minister in Northern Ireland was prosecuted for theological critique of Islam in a sermon he preached in his church, 70-year-old Pastor James McNaught. McDonnell, who was then recovering from cancer, faced up to six months in prison. The contents of his May 2014 sermon, Pastor McDonnell was prosecuted for a sermon he preached in May 2014 at Whitwell Metropolitan Tabernacle, Belfast, one of Northern Ireland's largest churches. The sermon was also available on the church's website, his theme was Jesus Christ being the only mediator between God and humankind and the only way to God. At the start of his sermon, he spent a few minutes speaking about the persecution of Christians in Islamic countries. This was then prominent in the news as the Islamic State was spreading rapidly across both Iraq and Syria, causing hundreds of thousands of Christians to flee. Meanwhile, in Sudan, Miriam Yaha, a pregnant Christian woman, had been sentenced to death for refusing to renounce the Christian faith she had been brought up in and was then awaiting execution. Pastor McConnell, ref McConnell referred to both events. Christians are persecuted, the homes burnt, churches destroyed and hundreds of them literally have given their lives in martyrdom. Also today, or, or in the next couple of days a lovely young woman by the name of Miriam, 27 years of age, because she has accepted Christ as a saviour, would be flogged publicly and hanged publicly. He stated that it was an irrefutable fact that those persecuting Christians in such ways was driven by the belief that Islam demanded this. He then went on to reject Islamic claims that the biblical prophets were all Muslims, including Noah and Abraham and Moses and even our Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor MacDonald stated that it was clear that Allah could not possibly be the same as the God of the Bible and so concluded that Islam was satanic. These beliefs and comments prefacing a 37 minute sermon focused on the Bible led to a social media storm calling for Pastor MacDonald's persecution. Four days later, Dr. Reed Al Wazan of the Belfast Islamic Centre lodged a complaint with the police and the police charged MacDonald under the 2003 Communications Act with broadcasting an offensive comment onto the internet. According to documents seen by the Belfast Telegraph, Dr Al Wazan had admitted in his police statement that he had not even listened to the sermon even though it was available online. Dr Al Wazan was due to have been the main prosecution witness in the trial However, a few months after accusing Pastor MacDonald, Dr. Al Wazan was himself embroiled in a controversy when he told BBC Radio Ulster that Islamic State had been forced for good, had been a force for good in his home city of Mosul, Iraq, making it the most peaceful city in the world. This was when Islamic State acceded Mosul and nearby, and nearby towns, causing an estimated 200,000 Christians to flee. A courageous Muslim scholar defended Pastor McConnell. A very different and courageous approach was taken by Muslim scholar Sheikh Dr. Muhammad al Husseini, who volunteered to speak in defence of Pastor McConnell. Dr. Hussein said he, he, grave, he had grave concerns about the prosecution of Pastor McConnell and strongly upheld the moral right of people of all faiths to freely debate issues. He added, Against the flaming backdrop of torch, torch Christian churches, bloody executions and massacres of faith minorities in the Middle East, it is a matter of utmost concern that in the country we defend the freedom of citizens to debate, critique religion, ideas and beliefs, restricting only speech which incites physical violence against others. The Public Prosecution Service for Northern Ireland PPSI first attempted to persuade Pastor McNeil to accept an 
informal warning, an admission of guilt which would have led him to a, a criminal record. However, Mc, McConnell saw this clearly as an attack on freedom of religion that he needed to fight declaring. Either they try me and put me in prison or I, or I am free to preach the gospel. A volley of criticism was levelled at the PPSNI when Pastor McDonald was found not guilty at a trial in January 2016. The PPSNI responded, This case gave rise to difficult and novel issues in relation to the limits to the defendant's freedom of speech and freedom to practice religion and required a careful analysis and consideration of all the relevant evidential and public interest, interest factors. McGonagall's comments about Islam were not known. In fact, immediately after his comments on Islam, he said the sermon, how he said in the sermon how others like Luther and Wesley have made similar statements. What was novel was the PPSNI attempt to seek to restrict Christian ministers' freedom of speech and freedom to practice his religion by prosecuting for making such statements. Case study six. University Test Act. Sheffield University requires social worker, social work students to support same-sex marriage. Between 1719 and 1871, Parliament repeated various laws and had excluded Roman Catholics and non-conformist Christians from employment in certain professions, including teaching in 1854 and 1856. University Test Acts, which excluded people from studying at certain universities, unless the affirmed particular beliefs were repealed. However, in 2015, academics at Sheffield University effectively introduced a new university test act by expelling a student from social work course because he had posted comments on Facebook supporting a biblical view of marriage. Felix left Cameroon. Felix uh, Nagore was born in Cameroon, a country that was basically a, a one-party state. It was described by Amnesty International in 2017, as a country where human rights defenders, including civil society activists and journalists, continue to be intimidated, harassed and threatened in response to curtailed freedoms of expression, association and peaceful assembly. Journalists, journalists reported that they self-censored to avoid repercussions for criticising the government. <clears throat> Expelled for answering a question about his Christian beliefs. Felix posted comments supporting freedom of religion in a private Facebook discussion. He, was responded, he responded to the case of an American marriage register. He was jailed after the US government's redefinition of marriage forced her to choose between losing her job or acting against her conscience by conducting same-sex marriages. During this private Facebook discussion, Felix answered direct questions about his own views. The Bible and God identified homosexuality as sin. Same-sex marriage is a sin, whether we like it or not. It is God's word and man's statement would not change his words. It's God's words and man's sentiments would not change his words. He stated these views politely and respectfully, but a couple of months later, Felix received an email from the university informing him that they were investigating his Facebook comments. A panel chaired by an academic interviewed Felix and removed him from his course. The academic failed to disclose her own conflict of interest as a leading LGBT campaigner at the university. And you can read uh, the rest of it. So here's a student, he's studying to do social work. He makes a comment that on <coughs> Facebook, private, not attacking gay people, but just giving his opinion about gay marriage, and the university holds a court, a court kind of proceeding, and takes him off the course because of that. Another example is a Christian teacher suspended for calling a pupil a girl who wished to be known as a boy. So. These are case studies, very well documented case, case studies of Christians le losing their free speech. But it's not only Christians losing their free speech. There are 
other groups, other people who are being targeted by the government. And here's some of the reasons why. Number one, secular humanism is deliberately undermining Christianity. Our recent decades, leaders of the humanist movement have implemented a bold yet subtle agenda for promoting their atheistic beliefs in Western countries. Biblical morality has been replaced with unbridled permissiveness, love of neighbour with materialistic narcissism, and truth with relativism. The result has been the destruction of personal Christian faith and the loss of all aspects of Christianity and the Church. One particular humanist strategy involves four stages. Number one, create tolerance of humanist ideas that are contrary to the norms, values and beliefs of the Christian heritage and society. Number two, pressure the authorities and society until humanist beliefs and behaviours are given equality with pre-existing norms of society. Three, reverse the norms and values of society so that Christian begins to seem foolish. Christianity seems foolish, backward, evil, a threat to human progress. Number four, work to make the previous norms of the formerly Christian society illegal. Working through education, the media, popular culture, and legal action, governments and international bodies, the humanist activists are well on the way to achieving their agenda in the UK, one of the most advanced areas of their activity. Number two, Political correctness is an outcome of identity politics which divides society into favoured and less favoured groups. Favoured groups are those deemed to have been oppressed in the past. They include women, ethnic minorities, LGBT and members of religious minorities in the West such as Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs. Favoured groups are assumed to require not just equal rights but extra rights to overcome past disadvantage. This greatly undermines another of UK's most important historical national values, equal treatment of all before the law. You see that with the, um, the issue of freedom of speech when it comes to uh, people can phone the police and say uh, it's causing, the language that I'm hearing is causing me distress and alarm. And uh, the whole of that language is all geared to the to the minority victim and anybody else who who is seen like uh, Christians or any group that's seen as the predominant group their values and their freedoms are not listened to It is absurdly unjust to treat people of one group, such as Christians, less favourably today than members of another group because of what happened to the second group in earlier generations. Why should we punish the present generation for the alleged sins of previous generations? Yet this is precisely what the advocates of political correctness do to Christians. In 2016, when Ashes Bakery in Northern Ireland were being prosecuted for declining an order from an LGB activist to bake a cake with the slogan supporting gay marriage, the Guardian newspaper wrote an editorial arguing, although it is individuals to have to choose between religious and sexual identity, the Lord should, when in doubt, protect sexual minorities over religious ones. This positive discrimination by the definition, definition discriminates against members of non-politically correct groups such as Christians. It's important to distinguish religious ideology, worldview, or any other set of beliefs from the human beings who hold those beliefs. People, e.g. Muslims, Christians, should be protected. Ideas and ideologies, e.g. E Islam, Christianity, should not be. So it should always be possible to critique and criticise ideas, even though this may hurt people's feelings. But any other kind of hurt to people because of what they believe should never be tolerated. Political correctness has overruled this principle and seeks to protect the beliefs of favoured groups from criticism. This is very dangerous because it undermines freedom of speech, freedom of religion and academic freedom. New laws to enforce beliefs. 
In just one decade, the government moved from promoting the rights of minority groups to enforcing the beliefs of those minority groups on churches and other voluntary organisations. One result was that Christians in some public sector jobs now have to act against their faith or lose their job. In 1998, a Home Office consultation document described marriage as the surest foundation for raising children. In 2002, the government supported the amendment to the Adoption of Children Bill, which allowed unmarried couples and were living together to adopt children. In 2004, the Civil Partnership Act granted legal recognition to same-sex relationships. In 2005, the government activated a clause in the 2002 Adoption of Children Act allowing same-sex couples to adopt children. In 2007, the government passed the Sexual Orientation Regulation, SOR, prohibiting any business or organisation from refusing to provide goods or services to someone because of their sexual orientation. Because the SOR was a statutory instrument, it was introduced without parliamentary debate or scrutiny. Secular humanist ideology often prevails in shaping government policy, even when it flies in the face of evidence. In a number of public sector jobs, Christians are now forced to choose between acting against their Christian beliefs or losing their jobs just, the day, just in the days of the Test Act centuries ago. When the Civil Partnership Act was passed in 2004, marriage registrar Lillian Landell told her employer, Islington Council, she had a conflict of conscience due to her Christian beliefs about marriage. She asked for reasonable accommodation, such as to officiate only heterosexual marriages, even though Islington Council accepted that it had more than enough other registrars to handle the civil partnership ceremonies. It refused a request. It demanded she act against her Christian beliefs or resign. Miss Laddell took her case to the European Court of Human Rights, where she lost on a majority verdict. However, the two dissenting judges in their powerful minority opinion stated, It is pertinent to observe that when Laddell joined the London Borough of Islington in 1992, when she became a register of births, deaths and marriages, in 2002 her job did not include officiating at same-sex partnership ceremonies. There is nothing to suggest that it was to be expected that marriage registers would have to officiate at these ceremonies in the future. If anything, both the law, the Civil Partnership Act 2004 and the practice of other local authorities allowed for the possibility of compromises which would not force registers to act against their conscience. In Ledger's case, however, a combination of backstabbing by her colleagues and the blinkered political correctness of the borough of Islington which clearly favoured gay rights over fundamental human rights, eventually led, eventually led to her dimis, dismissal. Andrew uh, McClintock, who had served as magistrate for 18 years on the South Yorkshire bench, was forced to resign after requesting to be screened out a case involving children for adoption with same-sex households. So, political correctness is not allowing Christian conscience it's not allowing Christian conscience. It's very, very serious. A civil society is everything that government does not control. It includes voluntary organisations, sport clubs, scout groups, campaign organisations. The government is now seeking to regulate civil society organisations, not simply on issues like child protection, but also enforcing aspects of an ideological agenda. In May 2014, Northern Ireland Assembly voted against redefining marriage, a decision which angry, angry LGBT activists blamed on Christians. Ten days after the vote, an LGBT campaigner walked into Ashes Bakery, which makes clear on its website that its owners are Christians and asked them to make a cake with the slogan support gay marriage. And the logo of the LGBT campaign group Queer Space, the owners who had previously declined orders that included nudity or offensive language, politely declined the request of promoting gay marriage, went against their Christian beliefs. The LGBT activist then filed a complaint with the Northern Ireland Equality Commission, who sent Ashes Bakery a letter ordering them to rectify the situation within seven days 
or be taken to court. The Equality and Human Rights Commission paid all the legal costs of the LBG activists which created the possibility that Ashes Bakery could be driven out by a business by the size of legal costs it incurred. The publicly generated gener the publicity generated by the NI Equality Commission taking up the case was allowed, followed by Ashes Bakery being subjected to threats including death and arson threats. Significantly, much of the legislation that has proved problematic appears to have been ideologically driven. The government could have followed the reasonable accommodation model of the 1967 Abortion Act that allow employees a conscious conscientious objection to taking part in abortions so they did not have to choose between their job and their faith. This was a very important provision and it prevented the creation of a backdoor test act by which to be a doctor, nurse or midwife, etc. However, there has been no provision for reasonable accommodation in any recent regulation, for example the sexual orientation regulation, which has the effect of a test act for a number of public sector posts. Misuse of human rights law. Human rights are good. Human rights were born because of the Bible's teaching. And there are two approaches to human rights. One approach says this is what the government is not allowed to do to people. Lock them up without fair trial, torture them, force them to hold particular beliefs in order to hold public office or stand for election. Etc. We use we see this approach in the Magna Carta, the U.S. Constitution, and English Common Law. The second approach, dating from the era of the French Revolution, in the late 18th century, is specific rights to every individual. For example, the right to life. However, two problems arise with the second approach. Firstly, there is no agreement as to what these rights are. Many humanists claim that the right to have an abortion is a human right, even though it involves the death of an unborn child. Secondly, one person's right can conflict with another person's right, for example, the right to freedom of speech, and the right to increasingly be and the right increasingly being claimed not to be offended. What then happens is that the police courts or government body have to decide whose rights are more important. This hands immense power to people who have never been elected to decide what is and what is not allowed, perhaps according to the dictates of political correctness, rather than in accord with human rights such as freedom of religion. Hate speech and hate crime and hate incidents. One of the consequences of the attempt to protect not just people but also beliefs of certain groups has been hate speech laws. The original idea of hate crime was that certain crimes motivated by hate, hatred or for example a person's race or religion should be treated more seriously. However, two major problems have been emerged with hate crimes. Number one, the coining of terms such as Islamophobia and homophobia have meant that instead of preventing attacks on people such as Muslims or gay, the lesbian people, one is prevented from criticising their beliefs. Second, the definition of hate crime is too, too broad. Almost anything can be called a hate crime if someone alleges that it is. The CPS and the Association Chief of Police Officer agree that a hate crime is any criminal offence which is perceived by the victim or any other person to be motivated by hostility or prejudice based on person's race or perceived race, religion or perceived religion, sexual orientation or perceived sexual orientation, disability or perceived disability, or any crime motivated by hostility, prejudice against a person who is transgender or perceived to be transgender. The police the CPS also asks people to report AIDS incidents which are not serious enough to amount to criminal offence. A 40-year-old Scottish evangelist was accused of hate crime in 2016 after preaching from the Bible to gay teenager Gordon Lamour was arrested by police after telling the story of Adam and Eve to a 19-year-old who asked him about God's view on homosexuality. The street preacher referred to Genesis and stated that God created Adam and Eve to produce children. Although he had not used any kind of offensive language, he was arrested. Within minutes, he was charged with threatening or abusive behaviour, aggressive by, aggravated by prejudice relating to sexual orientation. He spent a night in custody and was eventually cleared of any blame by the sheriff. 
So, so that's the booklet, Turn the Tide. Uh, you can get that booklet, it's very helpful. It's, on, it's from Barnabas Fund, it's on ourreligiousfreedom.org. Ourreligiousfreedom.org. Now you might not be a Christian, but personally I am shocked at what I've just read. To me, it shows a serious uh, decline in the freedom of speech in our country. I'm finding more and more as a street preacher, the net is closing in. Not just on me, but on people who are politically minded or people who uh, want to use public space uh, to propagate their ideas. One can see more and more an encroachment on freedom of speech, not only to Christians, but also to other groups as well. And I hope that these case studies make you sit up and think, because it won't just be Christians' free speech that goes, it'll be your free speech. There'll come a day when atheists are silenced from criticising Islam. There'll come a day when uh, you will have your free speech taken away, all right? So it's in the interest of all of us to, to defend our free speech. And I would encourage you to get this booklet, Turn the Tide, by Barnabas Fund. You can go on ourreligiousfreedom.org. Get the booklet and read it. I would also encourage you to go on to Liberty, uh, a website, it's a really good website, and just listen and read some of the work that they're doing. Um, they are doing a good job in defending uh, freedom of speech in this country. Remember, history repeats itself. If you don't defend the rights of Christians to have their free speech in this country, and in Europe, then don't be surprised when your free speech goes, okay, because yours will go next. Remember history, the Nazis took away free speech. Only a few in the church stood against it, but it was too late, because when free speech went, the Nazis were able then to implement the evil uh, regime. And if freedom of speech goes in our country, and it's going rapidly, it's deteriorated massively, then it will come a time when not only free speech goes, but it, there will be acts of violence, not only against Christians, but against any group that opposes the, the government of the day. So we need to stand up for free speech now. And uh, I would encourage you to stand up for free speech. It's not just about standing up for Christianity. It's standing up for all of us. All of us to have the right to be able to hold the beliefs that we have and to express those beliefs in public space. And I've given you solid evidence here in these case studies, that Christian free speech has been eroded in this country. And if you're a magistrate, if you're a politician, if you're in the media, if you're an academic, if you're a member of the public, whatever religion you are, whatever philosophical position you are, if you have a gift uh, to political activism, then I would encourage you to make a stand for free speech today. Like I said, my job's to preach the gospel. It's tired now. I've got to go preaching to, to uh, today uh, at ten o'clock. We're going uh, at eleven o'clock. We're going to uh, a town to preach the gospel. So that's what I'm going to do. I, I have to preach and, and and get on with that. But maybe some people who watch this video it, it might be tedious with the detail, but 
if it gets you to think about our country and where it's going and the need to put a stop to the erosion of free speech in our country. And also to challenge the prevailing ideologies of the day. Um, those are my thoughts. So I'm going to pray and uh, be vigilant. Our free speech is going. So be vigilant or history will repeat itself. Father God, I thank you for this country, Great Britain, Lord. I thank you. It's been an amazing country. It's done amazing things for you, Lord. It's it defended free speech in the Second World War against the encroachment of Nazis on I me. Mean. It's been a bulwark for freedom. Well, Father, our free speech is under threat in this land. I just pray that you keep the door open for freedom to preach the gospel in this country. That you would give us strength. That you would help us, Lord. Give us strength. And bless this land. Bless the people of Britain, Lord. And save us from the catastrophe that seems to be unfolding. And awaken the British people, Lord. Awaken them. To see the terrible danger that they're, they're, they're walking into, Lord. They're walking into a nightmare. And they don't realise it. And I just pray that you'd awaken them, Lord. That they would see that their freedoms are actually being taken away. I ask this, Lord, in your name and for your glory. Amen. Okay, thank you for listening. I know it's been a long, tedious video. Uh, it's been over an hour and a half. But um, it, it, it's an important topic. And, uh, yeah, so it's up to you now. I've given you some groundwork. It's up to you now to go fight for freedom of speech in our country. I, I'm not politically minded. It's not my gift. I, 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 my gift is preaching. Uh, but maybe you've got a gift for political activism. But it's up to you now to go and fight and make a stand in this country for free speech. Alright? God bless you.